Hey everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Alex Barkas, co-lead of our Canadian National Mergers and Acquisitions Group, uh, and I'm based in Toronto. And I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, today, we will be discussing the key tax and corporate considerations to keep in mind when planning for a cross-border M&A transaction. These range from prioritizing tax assessments upfront to must-have items for term sheets, the benefits of using certain types of structures over others, and various other post-transaction integration matters. Now to introduce our speakers. Um, Kimberly Burns is a partner in Adenton's corporate group based in Vancouver. She has extensive experience advising clients on public and private mergers and acquisitions, commercial agreements, corporate governance, international structuring, and partnering agreements. Mark Jad is the leader of the firm's Canadian National Task Group and is an active member of the Denton's Global Tax Steering Committee. His practice focuses on the income tax aspects of corporate mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, reorganizations, restructurings, and financings in both the domestic and international context. He provides tax advice to multinational corporations with respect to the establishment, acquisition, or sale of Canadian operations and to foreign private equity funds in connection with investments in Canadian businesses and properties. Linda Fodaker is a partner in the Denton's tax practice based in San Francisco. She focuses her practice on international tax and operational structuring for corporations, including structuring acquisitions, integrating legal entities, and advising on cross-border financings. And finally, Tom Redekop is a managing director in the firm's business law group with a practice focused on public and private U.S. mergers and acquisitions and capital markets transactions. Tom is passionate about M&A and eagerly consumes M&A developments. He frequently assists boards of directors, special committees, and transaction committees in M&A, including in structuring M&A and in assessing and managing actual and potential conflicts of interest. With that out of the way, let's get started. Uh, one of the things that I learned pretty early on in my career is that getting the tax team involved early in the process can pay dividends. And vice versa, the failure to get them involved early could lead to challenging outcomes. Case in point, um, historically, certain binding language included in an LOI could result in an inadvertent change of control for purposes of certain tax incentives for Canadian controlled private corporation. And once that LOI was signed, that was potentially irreversible and could be extremely punitive. This is just one example of the types of things that can trip you up in a transaction. Other things that are often negotiated at this stage and could lead to very tax outcomes include transaction structures. For example, what impact does a particular transaction structure have on the various stakeholders? Each transaction structure, whether it's a share purchase or an asset purchase, whether it's a merger or an amalgamation, has both pros and cons uh, from a corporate perspective and a tax perspective. And in particular, in cross-border transactions, certain steps can be affected in one jurisdiction versus others with very different tax outcomes. Another key item that often gets negotiated at this stage is the purchase price and how that should be structured. For example, what type of consideration will be used? Are we going to use share? Are we going to use cash or a combination of both? The type of consideration could uh, impact on tax planning, and it certainly could also impact on the indemnity and escrow mechanics, as we will discuss later on. Um, other elements of purchase price, uh, for example, should there be a performance-driven component? And if there is one, should that be structured as an earnout or a reverse earnout? Again, these all have different tax outcomes for the parties involved and need to be considered carefully. Um, one other approach that we often see is that parties focus on the big picture items at a term sheet stage and really defer the tax analysis to a later stage when transaction certainty is more obvious. And Tom, perhaps you can weigh in on what you've seen in practice on this point and why it may be problematic. Sure, Alex, I'm happy to do so. Uh, just to set the stage, I want to emphasize that the term sheet presents a great opportunity to manage the party's expectations relating to taxes. And it does that often by sketching out at a reasonably high level a transaction structure that potentially defers taxes or perhaps avoids triggering taxes unnecessarily early. However, for practical purposes, the parties might not have vetted the tax structure at the term sheet stage. So instead, the term sheet sometimes includes non-specific tax language along the following lines. It is intended that the acquisition be structured in a tax efficient manner for the parties. Mark, I've heard some people like this language and others are dead set against it. Can you comment on it? Yeah, sure. So, you know, 
just even taking a half step back, I, I, I get it as a tax practitioner, why clients don't want to invest a ton of money up front at the time of the LOI or term sheet, because, you know, there's a lot to be done. Due diligence has to be gone through and there's some uncertainty whether or not the transaction will ever reach fruition. Um, but, you know, those generic language, like you just um, said, Tom, I've seen that for years. And, you know, historically, I would say there's no issue with that at all. But what we've been seeing, and we'll touch on this throughout the presentation, is that um, in particular, we've seen an evolution in the general anti-avoidance rule in Canada. And currently, massive uh, reform of that rule is out for consultation. We're expecting we've got highlights and suggestions what it's going to look like uh, as it gets, uh, you know, the consultations are completed. But one of the major changes is that the rule used to say that when tax a tax benefit was your primary motivation uh, for un undertaking a transaction, then the GAR could apply. That's going to be watered down to one of the main reasons. So highlighting in an LOI that you're going to take steps for tax purposes, that starts to maybe raise some flags, maybe not. But there are other ways, I think, that are probably more appropriate. So for example, if your LOI said something along the lines that the transaction will be structured in a manner agreed to by the parties, taking into account commercial, regulatory, and tax efficiencies, um, I think that allows you the flexibility to build this out in a manner that's appropriate from a tax perspective without really saying that you know everything's going to be driven from tax. Thanks, Mark. Thank you both. That's uh, very insightful. And as Mark said, there's, you know, um, obviously clear value to staying ahead of somebody's structuring considerations early, but there's also a cost benefit analysis that needs to be run. And we, we clearly understand that sometimes it's not practical to address everything up front. And, but there are certainly some key areas that could be addressed. So just keep those in mind as you, as you think about your term sheet negotiation. Um, switching gears to our next topic, um, Kimberly, as mentioned already, one of the things that comes up in every deal at this early stage is transaction structuring. Could I please ask you to elaborate? Absolutely. Um, we're all familiar with the basic considerations for tax consequences to buyers and sellers in the eternal share versus asset debate. I was curious to see if law school teachings had changed. And so I went down the hall to our summer students and pulled two of them. And they're not getting anything new since my days. I've also just done a seminar with our U.S. corporate group, so I ran one of those associates and I asked the same question. And you'll be happy to know that if your law degree is from 1992 or later, the asset v share chart that you saw has not changed. In addition to the basics, though, in our practice coming into a transaction, our sell side clients, they have sophisticated tax planning already in place for exit events, and they know what they want. They're set up for a transaction. What has changed in my practice is discussion on acquisition vehicles. So in corporate, we do a lot of planning for clients expanding global operations into Canada. And we discuss whether to use a Canadian corporation for that business or not. From the business and operations perspective, the decision is driven by a few things, including for just for example, regulations of the industry, like local ownership requirements in cannabis operators, or tax credits in the industry, whether you're going to keep them or not. And for example, film industry production credits. However, these more bespoke aspects are secondary to overall analysis on the existing structure of the global business. And that really drives whether an acquisition vehicle will be used and what type of vehicle is best. So th this is the question from me to Mark and Linda. Can you describe and compare Canadian US buyer preferred vehicles to pick up a cross border company and the types of companies available? Um, on this topic, Tom and I were chatting yesterday and he has a second structuring question. So Tom, can you lay that out before we turn this over? Oh, sure, happy to. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, as a US M&A lawyer, I'm used to hearing tax lawyers like Linda talk a lot about the tax basis. But on my cross-border Canada-US deals, I also hear the Canadian tax lawyers speaking about puck. Uh, Mark, is all that puck talk because everyone would rather be watching Stanley Cup playoffs or is there more to it than that? 
So, you know, you're really touching on tax 101 and both of your questions together are really um, central to how um, we look at any acquisition, inbound acquisition into Canada, um, because the question's a puck, uh, not the hockey puck, so there's no K. Um, so paid up capital is what puck uh, refers to, um, tax basis, uh, vehicles, what type of vehicle you're going to use to acquire, all that is central on any transaction structuring. And really, if we're going to take anything out of today's seminar from a tax perspective, on the Canadian side, this is really the central theme. And so all of this, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to lay out first what all this is trying to deal with, and then I'll, I'll, I'll touch on your question, Tom, and then the, and Kimberly, maybe I'll come back to your question as to what type of vehicle. But as we're trying to uh, set up a structure, really one of the main elements is how do we maximize the ability to distribute profits or available cash from the Canadian enterprise after the acquisition without triggering withholding tax as the money crosses the border. So everything is aimed at that. And so to understand what we're trying to do in order to maximize the amount that can be distributed, there does have to be an understanding a little bit of what is puck versus cost. So um, puck is a corporate concept and it's based on the state of capital of the company. And that what that means is it's really more or less tracking the amount of money that's been invested into the company. Um, that's different than cost, which is how much a shareholder paid for the shares. So in the very simple example, a founder started a company and put in $100, the puck would be $100. The founder then sold the shares for a million dollars many years later. The buyer's cost is a million, but the puck is still 100. So that, that's the distinction that we're looking at. The amount that a company can distribute without it being considered to be a dividend is very different than the US. In the US, we look at earnings and profits to determine how much is a dividend and how much um, can be distributed without it being a dividend. In Canada, we look at paid up capital. So um, a corporation can distribute an amount up to its paid up capital before it starts triggering a dividend. So for in my example there, imagine that um, the US shareholder bought the shares from the founder for a million dollars and the company has cash and the, and the um, shareholder decides to pull out a half a million from the company. Well, that would trigger a dividend because there's only $100 of paid up capital. So what we try to do when we do our structuring is to do our best to make sure the paid up capital matches the cost that the shareholder is purchasing for the shares. And the way we do that is the um, US shareholder would establish a Canadian acquisition vehicle and would fund that vehicle with the acquisition price, be it shares, be it cash, whatever it is, would fund that acquisition vehicle with whatever the purchase price is. So now the paid up capital of that Canadian acquisition vehicle is equal to the purchase price because it's been funded that that company, the acquisition vehicle buys the target. Often they amalgamate, particularly if there's interest bearing debt in the acquisition vehicle. And we'll talk about funding a little bit later, um, but it doesn't have to. But the whole point is now we've created a scenario where the paid up capital of the acquisition vehicle is equal to the purchase price of the target. And that means money can cross the border post-closing all the way up to the purchase price before triggering a dividend that would be subject to withholding. So then the next question is, what type of acquisition vehicle are we talking about? And that was the question that Kimberly raised. And, and for that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda um, after I set it out because the question is always from a Canadian perspective, well, it's a corporate vehicle. And in Canada, we have two different types of corporate vehicles. We have limited corporations, and unlimited liability companies. You can get an unlimited liability company in BC, you can get one in Alberta, and you get one in Nova Scotia. Those are the three provinces that offer them. Unlimited liability companies provide zero Canadian tax benefits. They are taxed 100% the same way as limited corporations. So why are they popular? Why are they used in transactions? They're used in transactions because for US tax purposes, they can be treated as a disregarded entity. 
So a U.S. shareholder opening a ULC in Canada, it would be like they opened up a branch office for U.S. tax purposes. So Linda, I don't know if there's something you'd like to add on that. Um, well, I was going to say it in the reverse. So, you know, in general, we typically recommend non-U.S. acquirers don't own uh, an LLC in the U.S. that they use a C-Corp. And the reason for that is, you know, the LLC in the purely domestic context for us is a flow-through entity and uh, not subject to tax. But when there's a foreign parent, then we basically treat it the same as if we would a C-Corp. And so what does that mean? That means that the Canada parent is treated as being engaged in a trader business in the U.S., and therefore taxable on profits attributable to that activity. And so the real problem with that is that uh, the non the Canadian parent needs to file a tax return in the US. And for some reason, non-US folks don't like to get involved with the IRS. So uh, it, it really, if by creating a C-Corp and sort of putting a box around the activity happening in the US, you take that off the table and you sort of limit the exposure in the US to just what's happening within the corp and not um, allowing the Canadian parent to become subject to US tax directly. So Linda, we often see just along those lines. So now we're really talking in this context um, from, if I'm looking at from my Canadian prism outbound from Canada in, into mm -hmm. the US, um, you're, and, and if the target company that we're looking at acquiring is an LLC, um, you're, you're suggesting that that can be problematic for the Canadians, which I agree, um, you know, we've seen yeah. that. So what would you suggest yeah. we, we do I mean, it's, it's effectively the same as if you were just buying assets directly is what would happen if you bought the LLC 100%. And so basically what we re typically recommend and, you know, subject to what happens on the Canadian side, but on the U.S. side, we would set up a U.S. corporation and that U.S. corporation, and again, we'll talk about funding in a minute, but we would fund that U.S. corporation and that U.S. corporation would acquire the LLC interest. Um, it's different, you know, we'll talk a little later about some reorganizations and things like that, where we have a corp and we have, um, you know, rollover shares and things like that. But in the, if you have an LLC, which can be uh, quite common, again, if it's purely a domestic corp at that point, um, it's, it's good to set up a, a corporation here to do the acquisition. Thank, thank you. Um, that, that is not something that I picked up in school. Alex, I know you're moving on to the next topic. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, okay, so once buyers have determined their acquisition vehicle structure, uh, a topic that often gets a lot of airtime and for good reason is how to fund that acquisition vehicle. And you know, for Canadian inbound deals, we often see foreign buyers set up a Canadian acquisition vehicle for the reasons discussed by our panel just now. And those foreign buyers will often then want to fund that acquisition vehicle with debt or a mix of debt and equity. And Mark, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about this before. And I know from experience that the Canadian tax regime imposes some fairly rigid rules around the debt to equity ratio for acquisition funding. And also more recently, some additional rules have been implemented to govern excessive interest and expenses. Would you mind uh, explaining a bit more? Sure. So when we're looking, we've gotten to the stage now where there's been a Canadian acquisition vehicle that's been established. It's a corporation, whether it's a ULC because that's better for uh, the U.S. shareholder or it's a corporation. That's all determined on the U.S. side. Either way, we have a corporation. The next question is, um, what is how is that being funded, as you're saying, Alex? And there's really three possibilities. One is um, the U.S. shareholder is funding it with um, all cash. Um, and that cash could be coming in in the form of equity to the Canadian um, acquisition company, or it could be a loan to the Canadian acquisition company. There could be shares of the parent company coming in. That would usually be treated as um, equity, an equity contribution to the Canadian acquisition company, but not necessarily. It could still charge for it in the form of debt. The third possibility, and there can, and it, and it could be a mix, obviously. And the third possibility is the Canadian acquisition company could be borrowing from a uh, third-party lender. That that that's a third scenario. So um, whether or not the Canadian company is um, uh, it is borrowing from a third party or from the shareholder, we now have interest expense that's accruing in the acquisition vehicle. 
So the acquisition vehicle generally doesn't have any income because it's just a holding company. So part of the strategy, if there is going to be interest accruing in the acquisition vehicle, is to amalgamate the acquisition vehicle and the target immediately post-closing. And that pushes the interest expense into the amalgamated uh, entity and now can be used to offset operating income. So now we have a, a scenario where the acquisition can actually be reducing the amount of income that the target would have earned prior to the acquisition. And you can see from a government tax policy perspective, that raises some issues because we are now pushing debt into um, a Canadian business that wasn't there prior to the acquisition. And if that debt, it's one thing if the debt is being, you know, the interest on that debt is being received by a Canadian um, uh, lender and they're going to pay tax on it. It's another thing when it's going offshore. So there are a number of concerns and rules that are in the Income Tax Act that kind of limit the ability of that Canadian business to claim uh, interest deductions. The primary one, as you mentioned, Alex, that we've dealt with on many occasions are the thin capitalization rules. And that is looking um, at debt being pushed into the Canadian entity by um, a principal shareholder. So that's a shareholder that has at least a 25% interest in the Canadian company together with its related parties or non-arms link parties. If, if they're a significant shareholder in the Canadian entity and they're making a loan, um, there's a limit to how much interest uh, or how much interest bearing debt the target can have to those types of people. And we have a ratio and that ratio is one and a half to one. So one, so 150% of the equity amount of the company is available for interest bearing debt to these specified non-resident shareholders that I mentioned. So that's one set of rules that we always look at. So that means that if it's just a simple scenario where the shareholder is providing the capitalization, we say you can put in uh, $40, uh, $60 of debt for every $40 of equity that you put in. And that's your mix, 60-40. Um, we now have a new set of rules that are coming in effective uh, in October of this year. Um, and what these rules effectively look at is, it's one thing just to say the amounts coming in from the shareholder. But when we're looking at a multinational group, the, there's another mischief that can be done, which is parking more of the group um, uh, debt in um, high tax jurisdictions and lower portion of the group deck debt in low tax jurisdictions. So uh, in order to, to prevent um, a multinational from loading up on debt in the Canadian entity, the rules will limit the interest deduction to 30% of EBITDA. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a slight adjustment off of EBITDA, but EBITDA is, is a good starting point to think about it. We're calling it adjusted taxable income, but it's, um, but it is, uh, it, it, it's basically EBITDA. And so these rules really have to be taken into account going forward to determine not only am I crossing thin cap, but am I going to be able to get these interest deductions in the company? And that includes interest deductions to third-party lenders. So it's just really how much debt is, is in the entity um, and it's net interest expense. So if you're a borrower and a lender and you're making a spread, uh, th that, that's okay. So it's your net interest expense compared to your EBITDA. And there is an ability if a, if a multinational has uh, more than one Canadian entity and one's making money and one's not making money and the debt's in the wrong one. And you can borrow capacity, borrowing capacity from another entity and to, to sort of a semi-consolidation methodology. So similarly, Mark, on the U.S. side, I mean, we have limitations on interest expense and the rules got a little tighter in 2017 with tax reform. But I think the bigger you know, issue is there can be some benefit, obviously, from taking those deductions, even with those limitations. But the bigger issue from a U.S. Canada perspective, in my mind, is sort of generating that principle as a valve to repay the acquisition funds to the, to Canada if you want to get them those funds back. So meaning um, if you pay back principal, that's tax-free repayment of principal. Um, if we put it all in as equity, we'd be paying back, back as a dividend, again, subject to whether we have earnings and profits in the entity, which we hope we do after an acquisition. 
Um, but, you know, the dividend withholding tax is 5%, uh, best case under the treaty. So um, if you put some some debt in, it just provides this valve to get the money back tax-free without that withholding tax. Well, well thank you. something we touched on earlier about the difference between Canada and the U.S., we just look at capital, but you're concerned about earnings and profits. And so this right. is sometimes you're just not able to make a distribution even if you have capital and the debt is, is a good methodology. So that's an important distinction. Well, thank you both, uh, Linda and Mark. Um, just switching gears to uh, another topic that ties into some of the discussions we've had, but also introduces some new additional um, elements. Um, there are some challenges that we've encountered in transactions that involve shared consideration um, where, you know, it's typical to have some sort of uh, indemnity escrow that would be ordinarily used to, um, you know, sort of fund any indemnity claims uh, of the purchaser in the future. Um, and Tom, perhaps you can uh, weigh in on this a little bit more, um, if you don't mind. Sure, happy to. So, Alex, as you mentioned, on an M&A deal, we use escrows for many things. And one of those uses is to place a portion of the acquisition consideration in escrow to satisfy any post-closing indemnification claims. Now, when those shares are part of the acquisition consideration and are placed in escrow, the shares are going to be held by the escrow agent, and they're often registered in the name of the target company's shareholders. If a Canadian buyer's shares are placed in the escrow, and the shares are ultimately used to satisfy a buyer's indemnification claims, I understand that that can create some potential tax problems in Canada. And with that, I'm going to ask Mark to comment on it because uh, he and I have talked about this a number of times. Yeah, and, and, and Tom, as you know, this is really, really timely, um, this, this question. Um, I think historically, not a lot of thought was put into, you know, what goes into the escrow is usually cash in, in the old days. So the escrow, if there's a breach, you know, the purchase price is reduced and, and the cash is returned to the buyer. And uh, if there's no breach, the cash goes to the, to the seller and everything's fine. But as we started to get more and more, particularly in the cannabis industry, where the where these combinations were done strictly for shares and there was no real cash um, in the purchase price, the only consideration that you could put in the escrow agreement was a portion of the shares. Um, easy way, and, and I guess you can address this after a give the tax analysis, the easy way is not to issue the shares to the seller until they meet whatever, you know, you're clear, like the, you, you have a period of time. And if they, you know, meet the requirements, you give them the shares then. But if we're going to give the shares up front and have them in escrow, well, the shares are issued. And we talked about Puck earlier, but here, we're, this is not a cross-border um, question necessarily. We're talking about shares of the purchaser. And so the purchaser's shares, there's no acquisition vehicle of the purchaser. We're talking about the purchaser's shares, which may have a value that is much higher than its current puck. So if, we, if the shares of the purchaser are put in escrow, and then there's a breach or a price reduction for whatever reason, and the escrow shares go back to the purchaser, well, then they're effectively redeemed. And when we look at a redemption, we look at what did the um, person who held the shares, the redeemer, get in consideration for the shares? Well, what they got was a value equal to the purchase price reduction because they didn't have to pay cash for the purchase price reduction. They tendered the shares for the purchase price reduction. So they got a, they got a payment effectively equal to, if you think about it as in two steps, it's like they sold the shares for cash and then used the cash to fund the purchase price reduction. Um, so it's one step, they're just tendering them. And since those shares have been canceled, we have to look at our Canadian rules. It says anything over and above the paid up capital on a redemption of shares is deemed to be a dividend. So you can have that scenario that we talked about before where you paid full price for it, your cost is high, but the puck is low. And so as you tender it, and you're just getting a price reduction, you're actually getting a dividend, even though you got no money out of it. And so this question actually was put before uh, the Canada Revenue Agency last November as part of the annual Canadian Tax Conference uh, roundtable. And, and the CRA representatives confirmed that yes, 
this will give a deemed dividend if you put shares into escrow in the name uh, you know where the beneficial owner of it are the target shareholders the cancellation of those shares to the extent that the downward adjustment of the purchase price exceeds the paid up capital of the shares will in fact create a dividend in the hands of the selling shareholders thanks mark and alex i understand if we were to use a holdback instead of an escrow things work pretty nicely if all of the target shareholders receiving the, that consideration are based in Canada. But when there's a few in the U.S., what, what happens? Is, is it, does it work as smoothly or are there problems from a securities perspective? Yeah, so, so certainly I think if it was Canadians, um, one, of the, one of the things that um, sellers will be thinking about is, are there any Canadian securities law restrictions that um, will, will affect uh, my ability to then turn around and resell those shares once they're released from the escrow. From a Canadian perspective, for the most part, uh, holdback should not impact your ability to resell. Um, you know, those those shares are being issued under on an exempt basis, and there are exemptions that will allow you to resell as soon as those shares are are uh, released from escrow. That certainly may not be the case from a U.S. perspective, um, and certainly something that needs to be considered. And frankly, part part of the reason why I would think a lot of sellers don't like the whole back concept. Frankly, the whole idea of an escrow is, you know, to have something in a in the hands of a third party independent agent, um, and not have, um, you know, the indemnity consideration be at the discretion of the of the of the of the buyer. Right, that's the whole point. And so, as much as I think we want to lean towards the whole back hold back when we're on the buy side, I think. Um, that sort of doesn't really work as well for sellers. Thanks, Alex. Um, and, 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 you know, Mark, I got to say this, when, when we first, you and I first discussed this a number of years ago, this really took me by surprise. And I think I, I have to imagine it, it will take a, a, a lot of people by surprise if they haven't, if they ever haven't implemented a share escrow in, in recent years, because uh, I wouldn't have thought that that's the right outcome here, but certainly it seems like the CRA is taking a view on it. Yeah, no, I think that's right, Alex. I think that uh, what we noticed in a number of transactions as it evolved when we were dealing with counterparties, the first reaction was, no, that can't be right. And the second reaction was, holy cow, I think that's right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think uh, I think slowly it's, you know, uh, there's an understanding that it's an unfortunate result, but it actually flows from the tax attributes. Great. Um, all right. Well, we'll move on to our next topic uh, and uh, in the interest of moving things along. Um, I don't think we can have a webinar on cross-border M&A and tax consideration without discussing exchangeable share structures. So Kimberly, what are exchangeable shares and how are they used in cross-border transactions? Absolutely. Christina, can you put up the first slide? I wanted to provide a quick roadmap to this discussion with the hopes that it assures you we'll cover your questions. They may be myriad. I'm going to cover the who and the what. Mark and Linda will do the meat of the tax discussion. And Alex is going to lead sort of the hair on the dog. Um, I describe exchangeable shares as a hairy dog that hunts. So who? Who uses exchangeable shares? A U.S. corporate buyer of a Canadian target from shareholders that have a significant number of shareholders taxed in Canada, where the consideration offered is shares of the U.S. corporate buyer. So, Christina, can you put up the structure slide, please? Okay. What does it look like in the end? There are three popular structures. One involves the recapitalization of the target. One involves a Canadian amalgamation. And then there's the one set out on this slide. I'm describing only this one because it's the one I see most often. You can see that the US buyer creates a Canadian subsidiary that we, we refer to as Colco. And Colco doesn't normally have a lot of bells and whistles. Colco creates a second Canadian subsidiary that we refer to as Exchange Co. Exchange Co. will have a bespoke class of exchangeable shares in its capital structure used for the transaction, the usually non-voting. So sometimes, as on this slide, and I think we'll talk more later, the U.S. buyer creates a special class of special voting shares. 
Now, the Canadian shareholders of the Target, they're all either moved into the bespoke Exchange Co shares or they're given an election to choose between the Exchange Co shares or the USA buyer shares. And then I've shown on here the non Canadian Target shareholders simply move in to US buyer shares in the exchange. I'm not going to go further, but this is a simple diagram for a complex mechanic. And I will ask Mark, Mark, can you start off on the when exchangeable share structures are used? Yeah, sure. And and so what we're looking at, and actually probably better, Christina, if we just leave the chart up there, because um, I think we can follow along better. So we're, we're sitting in a scenario where um, there are Canadian resident shareholders of Canadian Target Co. with you know, significant accrued gains on their shares. And if they were to sell their shares for cash, they would just pay tax. Uh, and then, you know, on their gain, and it would be out of the cash proceeds. But if they're going to get shares of U.S. buyer, particularly if U.S. buyer is not public, but it includes where U.S. buyer is public, there's no tax deferred exchange that the Canadian shareholders can do with their target company shares. So to the extent that the consideration that they're getting are US co-shares, they have to pay tax on the gain of their target shares. And they would have to do that either with cash that they have outside the deal or by selling some of their US co-shares. And if the goal is to hold the US co-shares or if the goal of the buyer is to make sure that there's not a giant dumping of US, of US co-shares immediately following the acquisition, um, another mechanism needs to be used to defer the tax on the Canadians. And so while there is no tax-free exchange of shares of a Canadian company such as Target Co for shares of a US company such as US Co, there is a tax deferred exchange of shares of one Canadian company for another Canadian company. So what happens here is the Canadian shareholders at the time of acquisition um, transfer their shares to Exchange Co, which is in essence the acquisition company uh, that we've been talking about before. And what they take out um, from Exchange Co are shares that will give them US Co shares in the future, whenever they choose up to, and usually there's a limitation period, but, um, but they are exchanging their target shares. So those get transferred to Exchange Co and Exchange Co issues these special exchangeable shares to those shareholders. So that's a tax-free exchange to the Canadian shareholders. At a time of their choosing or in a liquidity event or at the approaching of a sunset clause, um, the Canadians can choose to exchange their exchangeable shares of Exchange Co for the US co-shares, generally on a one-for-one -one basis. That's when the gain is triggered because that now again, they're trading, trading Canadian shares for US company shares and there's no tax deferred exchange. But usually that happens right before, and you asked the when Kimberly, right before the shareholder wants to um, sell the US co-shares. So um, they, the deal is done. They're sitting now in Canadian exchangeable shares maybe going along for a number of years. The shares are always exchangeable on a one-for-one -one basis. So as the value of US Co rises, the value of their exchangeable shares rise. And then one day they decide they want to sell out of the whole enterprise. So they exchange their shares for US Co shares, pay the tax and sell their US Co shares in the market or however, on the liquidity event or whatever it is, and they get their cash. Okay, thank you. So you can see that, I mean, the slide, I, I called it complicated and hairy, and Mark's given you the tax hair, but in addition to that, if you're using this kind of structure, there are a lot of commercial considerations. Um, Alex, you're going to talk about some of those? Sure, sure thank you, I'm really happy to. So one of the core considerations is really trying to make these exchangeable shares look and feel as much as possible, like the ultimate share considerations that the sellers were really looking to receive, the, the sort of the parent level entity shares um, that they were otherwise going to receive had there not been these tax considerations that drove them into this exchangeable share structure. And so, you know, these sellers are going to be thinking about 
the usual stuff, voting, dividends, liquidation rights. And it's it's sort of a little more difficult to do because you're creating certain artificial rights given that your your interests are being held in a in a different entity than the actual uh, ultimate parent. And so for for voting purposes, this is often a discussion between buyers and sellers. Should these exchangeable shares even have voting rights that tie to the voting of the parent entity? Um, often because of complications. You do you do see exchangeable shares not getting voting rights, so it really does depend on the the specific leverage and and the dynamics in the deal. But there are ways in which um, the exchangeable shares can be voted, where uh, a trustee is set up uh, on behalf of the holders of exchangeable shares. That trustee is given a special voting share in the parent entity, and then exercises voting rights on behalf of the sellers of the instructions of the sellers who hold exchangeables. Um, you know, the other the other item that gets negotiated is what do you do when dividends are uh, um, granted by the parent? Should those dividends also be distributed pro rata to the holders of the exchangeable shares at the same time? Or one alternative may be to adjust the exchange ratio on the exchangeable shares uh, at the time of exchange to account for dividends that were distributed during the period in which the exchangeable shares were issued and outstanding. And then there's also wind down considerations. Um, the parties need to turn their minds to how to get out of the structure. It's clearly fairly complex to implement, uh, but at some point there may be a, a need for it to be unwound. And so you'll often see sunset clauses uh, in these in these uh, exchangeable share structures um, and and also mandatory conversions and certain triggers for mandatory conversions. And, and there will also be at uh, the same time considerations that um, relating to you know shareholder rights on liquidation and how to make sure that you're not going to sort of fall behind the other shareholders of the ultimate parent in the in the event that there's a liquidation event. So all to say, Exchangeable share structures sound great, um, you know, good tax outcome, but rather complex. And, and for this reason, we tend to see them implemented more on uh, larger scale transactions. Alex, I'm just going to chime in with a few words of caution from a U.S. perspective. Um, I've seen that often parties in an exchangeable share structure try to make the voting dividends and wind down provisions of the U.S. corporations, certificate of incorporation, subject to or possibly preempted by uh, the uh, support agreement or, or the shareholders agreement. And I've come across a few examples, including recently, where that approach may have been unenforceable of the law of the state in which the U.S. corporation was, was incorporated. So I think it's, it's one of those things that people get so used to doing day in, day out, and sometimes they don't think about the jurisdiction in which the U.S. parent option or the U.S. corporation happens to be formed, and it can create some, uh, some issues down the line. I had another question for Linda. Linda, Alex talked about the approach that's used to sort of service Canadian shareholders in an exchangeable share structure. Is there an equivalent structure that can help U.S. shareholders? I mean, we don't really see this particular um, complex <laughs> structure for U.S. shareholders. I think we have enough sort of um, general tax-free reorganization provisions that if there's sufficient, you know, common ownership at the end of the day by both parties, um, we can get there with simpler structures than this. So I think that's typically why we don't see this as much on the U.S. side. Thanks, Linda. And, and I think I should add, Tom, you know, we've talked um, a lot about the um, distinction in Canadian rules about puck, and even the call code, which I didn't get into in the analysis. Again, that's again the purpose is to maximize puck because if US Co bought the exchange co shares directly, it would be stuck with low puck. And so using a call co, it that becomes a new acquisition vehicle to buy the, the outstanding shares of exchange co. So these are things that are uniquely Canadian, and we wouldn't expect to see them on the US side. That's helpful. Thanks, Mark. Great. Well, that's some interesting discussions. And while I'm Sure, all of us can spend hours and hours discussing exchangeable share structures. I think we should probably move on to our final topic of the day.
Um, we often uh, come across holding structures where U.S. operating companies are held by a, a holding company incorporated in Canada, uh, often perhaps listed on a Canadian stock exchange. And these holding companies are often controlled by non-Canadians, whether that's U.S. residents or otherwise. You see this type of structure fairly commonly in um, certain U.S. cannabis companies um, that have sought Canadian listings. Uh, and as a result of some of the challenges uh, created by the U.S. federal regulatory regime, they're not um, they're not able to list on certain exchanges. They're putting certain structures in place to to deal with that. Um, Linda, we often use terms like sandwich structures and inverted companies. Can you please explain what these terms mean and why M and A participants should pay attention to those? Yeah, so the sandwich structure is basically where a Canadian company would be purchasing a U.S. company that already has a Canadian sub. And there's a question in the chat about, um, you know, more complex structures. And so it might be other countries as well as Canada, but basically putting the U.S. in between uh, two foreign jurisdictions. And so it just creates some tax complexity because you basically have to pass funds up from the foreign jurisdiction to the U.S. and then back out to Canada. And so the key is to, you know, sort of going back to our initial point that we started with, we're coming full circle, we're almost there. Um, but, you know, is to think about basically from the beginning, looking at the structure and seeing if there are other acquisition ways that can be done. So for example, if the U.S. is an LLC, maybe the buyer or target doesn't care that you want to purchase the non-U.S. entities directly from the LLC, because it's the same tax effect to them as if we just acquired the LLC. So sort of some, some pre-acquisition planning in that regard can help simplify the structure going forward. Um, inversion rules, that's a whole another topic that we'll, uh, we have our second webinar topic, <laughs> but uh, that's basically where, you know, a foreign entity acquires a U.S. company and the potential rules that apply would basically treat that U.S., the, the acquiring company in Canada as U.S. tax resident going forward. Um, usually it's not too much of an issue when it's a true acquisition and the Canadian company has substantial operations in Canada and it's, um, but it's something to be looked at just to make sure you don't run about those rules because the worst case scenario would be that the acquirer is actually a U.S. company at the end of the day. So it usually happens in internal reorganizations rather than third party um, acquisitions, but it can come up and it should definitely be looked at. Certainly. And I mean, you and I, Linda, you know, sort of looked at this in a recent transaction where the fact that one of our the companies was inverted changed the tax plan a fair bit and 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 eliminated some of the alternatives that, that we were looking at. Um, certainly something to keep in mind. Mark, you and I have had a number of discussions on this topic um, as we sort of navigate these complex holding structures. Uh, I'm mindful of the application of the foreign affiliate dumping rule regime. Uh, has a nice acronym FAD, but their application can be quite punitive in certain circumstances. Can you can you please elaborate? Sure. Um, at a really high level, just like Linda said on inversion, we could have an hour long seminar uh, on the FAD rules and barely touch the surface. But um, putting it this way, Canada frowned uh, on the idea in general of a Canadian company being the cream in the Oreo cookie. Um, it does not like uh, structures where you have a foreign controlling parent and foreign subsidiaries and a Canadian company in the middle. So there's a lot of mischief that can be done with that structure. And so the initial reaction, I believe it was 2012, where the Department of Finance decided to make it so draconian, um, so, so punitive with, uh, to have that kind of structure that they came out with a set of draconian rules that basically created any investment or any ownership downstream by a Canadian company to a foreign affiliate. It was deemed to be a dividend to the, the same amount was deemed to be a, par, a dividend to the foreign parent triggering withholding tax. The problem with the original set of rules is that there are a lot of legitimate situations that arise that aren't aimed at developing mischief um, that would run afoul of the rules. So the general form of the rules remain unchanged, but there's a number of exceptions in some ways an ability to manage, um, but the complexity remains. And so the word of caution arises on an M&A transaction where a US company wants to buy a Canadian target that has foreign affiliates. Um, thinking about how to manage the FAD rules after the acquisition is something that's really an imperative because 
while there are ways to deal with it, uh, it often requires um, annual tax elections, monitoring amounts that are invested through the structure into the ultimate affiliates, um, how you capitalize. There's a whole whole bunch of issues that can arise. And, and if that's what we're looking at acquiring, it's a target with significant um, foreign, uh, foreign affiliates, FAD planning has to be part of the initial acquisition thinking. And that does take us back full circle because that's something that needs to be really thought of at the stage of the LOI. Is this something we are going to be able to manage? It, and I'll just add one more point on that, Mark. So as, part, as in terms of post-merger integration, there's a question also in the chat about transfer pricing. And I think having some thought initially pre-close about what those operations look like, how integrated things are going to be, um, who's going to be using what IP, or if they're completely standalone, but sort of taking some initial thought up front that after, you know, immediately following close, we have to do X, Y, Z to document any intercompany transactions and make sure that, um, you know, everyone has a right to be doing what they are actually doing post-close. Thank you both. Uh, I think that concludes sort of the formal discussion. Uh, I want to leave a little bit of time for uh, some, some Q&A, and I know that we have some questions already uh, that were in the chat. Um, and if there are others, feel free to add them to the list. But um, Mark, one of the questions that's uh, come across is um, how, how does a cross-border deal impact tax treaties uh, between the involved countries? And are there steps that are being taken by the various tax authorities to prevent tax avoidance or evasion? You and I have had some chats about this and given some of the recent developments on that front and would like your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very timely question. So there's a couple of elements. One, where tax treaties first come into play is when you're making distributions or sales of, of the shares of the companies down the line, but primarily on on distributions. And, um, and so the Canadian withholding tax rate on dividends is 25%, but, but where there is a treaty partner, that rate is, uh, and the owner of the shares is in that treaty country, the rate is generally reduced and it can be as low as 5%. Um, in the past, part of the job of the tax practitioner when we're doing cross-border inbound or outbound was figuring out what countries will be the intermediary countries, sort of drawing boxes all over the world in order to maximize the ability to use tax treaties. So in the last few years, um, the OECD, as part of their um, base erosion and profit shifting um, uh, global initiative, um, came up with, with something called the multilateral instrument. And the multilateral instrument is effectively a treaty override. And so if um, two parties, so there's over 100 countries that have signed the MLI, but if, the, if two parties to a treaty have signed the multilateral instrument, then the multilateral instrument overrides the treaty between those two parties. And one of the key things, so there's different elements you can opt into in the MLI, but one of the things you can't, that's mandatory, if you sign, you agree to, is that um, if the principal purpose for a transaction or um, an arrangement is to take and get an advantage under a tax treaty, then you're denied that advantage. So that means if you're setting up a company, let's say in a Luxembourg or the Netherlands because of the favorable tax treaties with Canada, uh, and that's the reason you're there, then you don't get the benefit of that treaty. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something that's been curtailing it. Interestingly, the United States is not a signatory to the MLI, and you can explain why, Linda, but there's another reason. Because we don't do things that anyone else does. <laughs> we like to go it alone, <laughs> the USA way. But, but you have the limitation of benefits clauses in, in your treaties. We do, we do, but it, but it's also a congressional issue. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but kind of not. We it, It's our position that we don't want to sign on to things that we like to do it our own way, and we have LLB provisions, so that's how we address it. Thank you both. Um, one of our participants really likes exchangeable share structures, so wants to understand more about the purpose of Colco. Um, could Colco, ExchangeCo, and Target not be amalgamated after the sale transactions so that the Canadian Target shareholders have exchangeable shares in Amalco? Uh, 
So I'm going to do this really quickly, Alex, um, yeah. because it's pretty it's pretty techy. Um, but um, the way the exchangeable share structure works is that um, technically under the share provisions, which is the only way it can be done, um, the holder of the share uh, the can he, uh, of the of Exchange Co would go and redeem the share um, back to Exchange Co in exchange for a U.S. company share, which in theory Exchange Co would acquire from the U.S. parent. Problem with that, if that actually came to fruition, is that would be a dividend because um, it's now a redemption of a share of Exchange Co. So that's not in anyone's interest for that to happen. And so um, instead, what happens is that there's a sale. And um, so the moment that uh, a shareholder wants to exercise a redemption right, the call co, which is not the issuer, another company in the chain, has an overriding right to purchase the exchangeable share from the shareholder. Since that's not a redemption, but a purchase by an, a different entity, it gives, right, it gives rise to capital gains tax. And if structured properly, because the US Co has to fund the call co with the shares in order to pay for it, the US Co gets additional paid up capital in the call co. So uh, it's complicated, but that's the, that's the rationale. Great, thanks, thanks, Mark. I, there are a number of um, other questions that are in the Q and A. We fortunately are running out of time, but we will endeavor to respond to those in writing to the participants uh, after this call. Um, and if you have any other follow up questions, on uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of the participants, and we'll we'll guide them accordingly. Um, thank you all for attending today's session. Um, our recording will be circulated to all attendees in the coming days. And um, we uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.